So I grew up in uh, Germany uh, up to the age of 15. Uh, at 15, I left school. I just couldn't stand it anymore, so I refused to go to school. My parents had gotten a divorce. My dad had moved to Spain. And my mom didn't know what to do with me. Uh, I was just hanging around at home, didn't want to go to school anymore. So I was sent to live with my dad in Spain, where I lived for four years, up to the age of 19. Uh, without going to school, my dad was always a very unconventional person, and he asked me, do you want to go to school? I said, no, and he said, well, then don't. Wow, so I, what, what were you doing? I pursued my own interests. I read some, started reading the literature, of course, learning Spanish, learning English. I loved languages, I loved reading, I loved literature. At 16, I started working part-time uh, as a translator of restaurant menus. And then I became a tour guide, when I was 17, I became a tour guide for uh, taking people around from cruise ships around the Spanish town where we lived. And then uh, at uh, 19, I moved to England to work. Um, in England, I was immediately, I immediately felt at home. That I have to feel some deep connection with England. Hmm. And uh, I worked in England for uh, four years, full time and became more interested in intellectual things. So I took all the necessary exams that uh, were required to get into university. They're called, well, at the time they were called O-levels and A-levels and so on. So I took those exams. And finally I got a, a, a scholarship to get into London University where I studied modern languages and literature. And so that's the external uh, story. On the inside, I experienced increasingly uh, uh, periods of terrible anxiety and depression, even while I, while I was working and while I was a student. Um, can, can you describe what that was to you yes, at the time? Yes, um, it was uh, uh, an inability to stop my mind. My mind was continuously racing along and creating uh, scenarios of uh, where I failed, where I uh, lost even the little that I had. It, it went a lot into the past too, where I uh, felt ashamed about things that happened in the past. Um, but not only that, there was a deeper existential fear and an ex existential anguish that's uh, hard to describe. It. Uh, it is a kind of alienation from the world. Uh, alienation is probably the best word where everything that you uh, come into contact with feels strange and alien. You're disconnected from everything and everybody. And uh, that is something that um, I believe many people these days suffer from, mm -hmm. although it has also existed, uh, it, it has happened to isolated individuals in the past. If you want to read about that state, I recommend uh, in the Old Testament there is the book of Ecclesiastes, which starts with the famous phrase, as in the old translation, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. But what it really means, if you use a modern term, I would translate it as everything is so effing pointless. Mm. What's the point of it all? So the, to be deeply affected by the seeming meaninglessness of life around you. So I remember when I went into a department store in London or walked along the streets, it, it seemed so so absurd that people were buying all these things and then going out with their shopping bags full of stuff. Everything seemed so absurd and meaningless, almost producing a kind of nausea. And that nausea is actually a novel by Jean-Paul Sartre where he de describes that state. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's exactly how it is. Um, it's, it is described in various places in world literature too. Uh, for example, in Anna Karenina, at the end of the book, just before she commits suicide, uh, 
the world the Tolstoy describes how she sees the world just before she commits suicide and everything is just every human being she sees is despicable and dreadful and, and total disconnection from the world around her. So that is the existential anguish that uh, uh, I also experienced yeah. quite frequently. Did, did you have a sort of rock bottom moment with that? Was there a specific moment that then started your turnaround? Yes. Uh, so I would often wake up in the middle of the night in a state of panic or fear and uh, almost feeling breathless. And one night I woke up again around three in the morning and uh, my mind was racing along. And then a strange thought came into my mind that said, I can't live with myself any longer. I can't live with myself any longer. And after thinking that thought, there was a kind of, a, a little shift occurred. I was standing back from that thought, so to speak, and I thought, what a strange thought to think, I can't live with myself. Am I one or am I two? Hmm. Who is that self that I cannot live with and who am I? So a kind of inner separation occurred and uh, I felt like of disappearing into a kind of void. And the next morning I woke, woke up and I felt incredibly peaceful for some reason. I didn't understand why. It took me several years to understand why from that point onward there was always, in, sometimes in the foreground, sometimes in the background, a sense of inner peace, no matter what my outer circumstances were. But now I can ex actually explain what happened that night. There was a disidentification in my consciousness from the stream of compulsive and incessant thinking that most people have absolutely no control over. People say, I think, but th that is usually not the case because thinking happens to them. Mm -hmm. They have no control over it. So it, it is actually wrong to say, I think. It would be the same as you were saying, I'm beating my heart. You, you're not beating your heart. It's t done for you. It happens to you. Yeah. So there was this what I now call the voice in the head, that I was completely identified with. So I was completely identified with the stream of thinking, that, which is quite normal, for many people are. Uh, and uh, a lot of that stream of thinking was of a negative nature. So I d did not experience the reality around me uh, except through the veil of negative self-talk, the veil, the mental veil of negative, of negative labeling and interpretations. And I, my whole, what I consider to be my life, I hadn't realized until I disidentified, what I took to be my life was a narrative in my mind. And it consisted of certain things from the past that I identified with, things that had happened to me. It was a, a bundle of thoughts that recurred continuously that gave me my sense of self. And it was an unhappy sense of self. It was a narrative-based sense of self. And that night, I stood back from this narrative, which is uh, fueled by continuous thinking. I stood back. And I, I realized for the first time a dimension of consciousness within myself that was deeper, one could also say higher, depends how you want to look at it, mm -hmm. deeper than thinking. Now this dimension of consciousness that's deeper than thinking, I now call it awareness or I sometimes call it presence. And that exists in every human being, but most humans are not aware of it at all. They don't know that there is a deeper dimension of consciousness in them. And that dimension is transcends thinking. Uh, it, uh, you experience it uh, when the mind becomes still for a moment. Uh, this is what people want to achieve, for example, when they meditate. Mm -hmm. It can also happen to you when you're engaged in a dangerous activity like mountain climbing then you cannot be involved in thinking. You have to, conceptual thinking stops, but 
you do not lose consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the important thing is, there is a state of consciousness uh, possible in humans where you are fully conscious without the activity of conceptual thinking. That's also the essence, for example, of Zen. And I would suggest that it's actually the essence of all spirituality is to find that state of consciousness in yourself where you can be alert and aware but you, there's no conceptualization in your mind. It doesn't mean it stays like that for a long time. You then go back into thinking. But if you're able to access that dimension in yourself, you are no longer possessed by your thinking mind. You are no longer used by your thinking mind. You are actually able to use your mind instead of being used by your mind. As long as you're used by your mind, all your mental activity is a reflection of the conditioning that has happened to you. Mm -hmm. So you take on the conditioning from a personal, on a personal level, from school, parental background, and so in that conditions the way that you think. Then you have the collective conditioning around you. You take on the conditioning of the, the culture that you in, inhabit that's around you. Uh, if you. If you watch the media every day, then you take on those viewpoints and that you think they are your thoughts, mm -hmm. they are not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. you, you take these thoughts on from the outside. 